Bless you, Jesus. the Lord. As we bow before your throne, as we bow, majesty and honor.
I see the Lord and his train fills the temple. I see the Lord, he is high and lifted up. I see the Lord. And his train filled the temple. I see the Lord, he is high and lifted up. And angels cry. I 
see the Lord and his eyes are flame they're like fire yes they are I see the Lord and his hair is white as the angels cry angels cry for the Lord if it costs you all your money if it costs you all your houses if it costs you your family will you go for the Lord because unless a man counts the cost before he builds a house he's a foolish man it costs to serve Jesus 
It costs to serve him. It costs you your reputation. It costs you all your friends if you're going to follow Jesus. The way of the cross is not easy. And few will there be that will take it. Just a few there will be that take it. Because everybody talking about heaven ain't going. Everybody talking about Jesus don't know him. Who will follow him? Who will follow him? Oh, angel of the Lord, take the coal from the altar. Oh, touch it to our lips, for our lips are unclean. Let your holiness in this place, Father. And we cry, holy, holy is the Lord. And we cry. I don't know if you realize it, but just a few minutes ago, the Spirit of the Lord moved in this place. He's dealing with hearts here already. He's already started. We were worshiping the Lord. We started talking about our hearts not being right. We got quieter. Because you're here tonight, you don't know Jesus. It's the reason you don't worship him. Father, we stand in your presence. God, we know we stand here with unclean lips. We know we stand here with imperfection. But we're so hungry and so desperate for you, Jesus. We need you so much. And we know, Lord, anything that we count pious or holy in ourselves is just filth to you. Because we don't understand your holiness at all. We have no idea. But Father, I think I speak for most of us here tonight. We want to. We want to know you. We want to know you, Lord. Show us you, Lord. We don't want to know church anymore. We just want to know you. We don't know what, we don't care about good preaching or good music. There's been enough of that to win the world. But there's been too little of you. Too little of you. I want more of you, Jesus. It's all about you. When the music fades And all is stripped away And I simply come I'm longing just to bring Something that's of worth That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song A song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart It's 
of endless worth no one could express how much you deserve and though i'm weak and i'm poor all i have is yours every single breath I'll bring you more than a song A song in itself Is not what you have required You're searching us, Jesus You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into I'm coming back and grace more, 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 more and I need you more more than yesterday I need you Lord more than words can say Bye. 
Sing it to him, church, not to me. More than yesterday, I need you, Lord. More than words can say, sing it. More than words can say, I need you, Lord. Than ever before. Because the Lord has touched me with a greater thing. I used to be happy with religion, but not anymore. I used to be happy with Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night prayer, but not anymore. I used to be happy with following him afar off, a long ways away, but not anymore. Cause I want to hear the heartbeat of God I want to hear the heartbeat of God I want to look on the face of Jesus Cause he touched me with a greater thing And I'm not the same so I never want to go back to my old life. I need you more. Yeah! Yeah! Yeah, 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 yeah! Wow. Come on, lift your voice. Come on, lift your voice. Yay. Yeah. 
Indulge me just a couple of more songs, okay? Took me a while to get going, but I'm going now. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is not my song, but there are some things I may not know. There are some places I may not go. Oh, but there's one thing. There's one thing I surely know. Yes, I do. My God is real. For I can feel him in my soul. My tell you just how you felt when Jesus washed all your sins he washed them all away yeah but I can tell you since that day yes and since that
I walk by faith and not by sight. I walk by what I know and not what I feel. But I'd hate to know that I never felt anything. Have a strong feeling that the early church felt something on the day of Pentecost. I have a strong feeling that with a lame man by the gate got up, he felt something. I have a strong belief that when the waters were troubled and the man that was lame from his mother's womb started picking up his bed and walking, he felt something. I have a good idea that when Bartimaeus saw Jesus, and said, have mercy on me. When his eyes opened up, he felt something. I don't know where the church has decided in the last 35 to 65 years that we wasn't feeling anymore, but I'm glad I know a God. That's still real. And you can call it feeling, emotionalism, or whatever you want to call it. I'll wave at you when he comes. I'm going to feel that too. Because I once was lost. And now I'm found. That's why my feet want to dance. That's why my voice wants to shout, but it can't. My, 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 my. And I have a feeling this is what Martin thought when he wrote this song. I could sing an ending songs of how you saved my soul. 
And I could dance a thousand miles. You know, you can't really dance a thousand miles, but you feel like you could. Because of your great love. My heart is bursting, Lord, to tell of all you've done, of how you changed my life and wiped away the past. One, two, three, and...
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know what? One more time before we quit, I want us just a second to lift up a shout to the Lord. I feel like tonight, y'all feel like that little boy, you know, who his daddy said, sit down and be quiet. He said, Daddy, I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> what these guys were doing over here, that's what I'm doing right now. I want you to lift your voice again. How many of you have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus? Come on, lift your voice. Hallelujah. Jesus, bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. You know, you may have, you may have looked around tonight. How many of you are here with us? It's the very first night you're with us in a service. And keep your hands up if this is your first week with us in a service, and raise your hands as well. Wonderful. God bless you. You may be looking around tonight and maybe you've been in revival for a while and you're noticing a few familiar faces aren't here or maybe you're just visiting with us but you've seen videos from the revival and you notice that, well, our worship leader said that he had a sore rib and couldn't really belt it out the way he wanted to, but I think we all did just fine tonight. <laughs> And uh, you may have looked around and noticed, boy, there, there is this silver-haired brother that's normally here. Where is he? Well, Associate Pastor Kerry Robertson is, is overseas ministering. And you may have noticed, well, well, that doesn't look like Pastor Kilpatrick. Pastor Kilpatrick's not here tonight. And you may have looked over there and said, well, boy, the evangelist Steve Hill isn't here. But Jesus is here just the same. He's doing just fine. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now, nobody here is ever on this platform to perform or put on a show, but I want you to know that if you came to be entertained or you came to have someone put on a show for you or you came to see a person, you're in the wrong place. If you came to meet with God, you are in the perfect place tonight. God's going to touch you. He's going to change you. He's going to meet you. I was just handed a sheet of paper before. We've got uh, 60 people from Puerto Rico listening with headsets. Where's our crowd from Puerto Rico? Raise your hand. Where are you? There you are, folks. Praise God. Welcome. We've got, we've got 22 listening to translation in Portuguese. Where are folks, our Portuguese-speaking folks? Bless you. Are, are you from Portugal or Brazil? Brazil. Brazil. Wonderful. We have uh, other international guests who speak English. We have folks from Germany and Japan who speak English, but we've got six folks from Germany listening to German translation and five from Japan listening to Japanese translation. But I'll tell you, wherever you are, whatever language you speak, whatever your culture, God knows you. God knows where you live. God brought you here tonight, and he's going to meet you in a powerful way and change you. But uh, Bill here is uh, Milt. Milt is um, 75 years old involved in prison ministry. And uh, what, what would you say to some of the younger folks here? Get with it. That's what you, you told me.
<laughs> are, you, uh, are you getting ready to, uh, you know, just look back at the past and retire and quit and, and give up? No, sir. I didn't start until I was 52 years old. And I got a lot of catching up to do. And that's what I'm doing right now. And I, I spoke to you the other day, and we're going to be starting with uh, Mr. Carver's approval, of course, uh, to organize an outreach ministry visiting the local prisons. And we're, we're in, a, in the process of doing that right now. I was in a local jail today, Escambia Jail, uh, on the route side, met, met the pastor over there and everything. And uh, we're going to be going into there very shortly, as soon as we get approval on that. Wonderful. So. Bless you, man. Thanks. Thank the Lord. Amen. The, the Lord's assembled an awesome team. We've never really uh, done this uh, in a night service like this, but uh, pastor wasn't going to be here tonight and asked if we could have some student testimonies. And uh, Steve will be here tomorrow night. Uh, everybody's fine and healthy and strong. But uh, I just want you to meet some of the, the folks that are key players in the school. We've got an awesome staff. We've got about 90 people employed by the school and from folks in the registration office to accounting to cafeteria to working in the dorms, grounds, across the board. Everyone's essential. I just want you to meet some of our faculty that, that is here with us tonight. Our academic dean, Bob Gladstone, just <laughs> wave at the people. Been with us since day one, God sent from heaven. He and his wife, Gina, and their kids. And then John and Joanne Kava. Bless the Lord. John heads up our missions department. We're friends going back to Long Island. And then our associate missions director and his wife, you, the, the, the two are one, Josh and Toby Peters. God bless them. God called them back from Indonesia to, uh, to work with us. And these folks are taking workers out around the world constantly. Our heart, listen, there are people who got saved at this altar here that are not a, now on their way to overseas missions or to pastoral work or to serve in different ways in the, in the work of God. Their hearts are to go and to give and to serve. And we, we've got a number of people with us. Steve Alt, wave everybody, Steve. <laughs> Faithful faculty member, teacher, just does whatever we need him to do, does a great job. And uh, our... Newest addition from New England, Bert Farias. Bert. Bert and his wife, Carolyn, came back from nine years in Africa. And Bert heads up our, our third year uh, intern program, is coordinating that. Uh, then we have a man who uh, is a walking encourager, Larry Tomzak. Bless you, man. He commutes from Atlanta to the school, and, and he stays with one of my dear friends. And I, I ask, well, what's, what's Larry like in the morning? Does he get up just the same full of life that's just the same in the morning and at night? I think Jesus is kind of consistent too. Amen? And then our director of pastoral care and a key faculty member, Pastor Bob Phillips. The job that he and the pastoral staff do at the school and the teaching is extraordinary. These folks are just God sends to us, every, every one of them. Uh, Bill Ansara, our music director, is not here. And uh, one, one of the things, we've got some other uh, elective faculty members that are not here, but one of the things that the Lord spoke to us to do was to, to start a program for teaching English as a second language. You say, why is that? It's so that we can send people into China and other nations as English teachers to do the work of missions. See, a lot of these places are closed to missionaries, but you can get in as an English teacher. And God sent us a wonderful couple from Canada. And Pat McCormick, wave at us, Pat, <laughs> teaches English as second language. And we've got over 100 students in the program now, don't we? And our husband, John, Helps us with placement and everything full of life, faith, 
victory. Thank God. We, we just want to express our appreciation. And uh, I'm going to have you be seated in a moment. But I want to call a few folks up here that are going to share some testimonies with you. Pastor Bob's going to get them to share their testimonies. But listen, we could give you testimonies. If you had a week, we'd give you a week's worth. If you had a month, we'd give you a month's worth. If you had a year, we'd give you a year's worth. Either how people got saved at the revival or right with God at the revival and are now in the school or transformed in the school or what's happened when they've gone out on the mission field or what happened when they were evangelizing on the streets. But I'm just going to call up a few before I bring you the message tonight. And, and this will just give you a little indication of, of the greatness of the work of God. This is all to the glory of God. But uh, Glenn, also known as Cowboy, come on up here, brother. Where are you? And then uh, I, I want you to hear from another student. God did something exceptional. His family, Bruce, if you and your wife could come on up here. And then I'm going to ask a young man who uh, had the distinction of marrying our younger daughter two weeks ago. It was really okay, though, because our last name is Brown, his last name is Bruss. I figured it wasn't that big a change. I could live with it. Plus, I liked him. I felt good about it. Ryan, come on up here with a, a few of the folks that have been on outreach. Bring them up with you. Ryan heads up our local outreach. And this young lady has got a big smile on her face. She's kind of beaming. And uh, I'd be beaming and smiling if, if I were her tonight. You say, why is that? Well, because she was on her way to church tonight. And just as she was pulling into, about to pull into church, somebody slammed into her car. And she was in an accident. It wasn't, oh, it wasn't your car. That's why you're smiling. <laughs> but, but you were driving. No. You weren't driving. Oh, who are the guys that... Are you guys smiling too, even though it was your car? What's that? No damage. Praise God. That's all right. Some people get shaken up, and she's a little shaken up, but we prayed, and she's beaming again because Jesus rules. Amen? Amen? So, Pastor Bob, you folks can be seated. <clears throat> Glenn, would you come and just uh, share with us? Uh, some things. I remember him on uh, uh, one occasion. It wasn't your first time, but um, I think Timothy Davis was here preaching that Sunday, and you were right over in this section, and uh, he was talking about some things that you need to correct in your life, and a shout came out from over there in that section. Uh, That's me, brother. And, I mean, he was ready to climb over the, the pews to get to the altar. So why don't you just share with us just some highlights of what God is doing in your life, and, and maybe if you could... Uh, what God did to, to get you here, and, and then what's really happened since you've been here? Well, first of all, following Dr. Brown is like an avalanche. It's like a snowflake following an avalanche. So I ain't going to move on you too much because he's a powerful man. Uh, but what happened, uh, I lived up in Utah. I was up there six years. God had me in the wilderness, as you know, up in Utah. And uh, I was a Baptist boy, and... Uh, didn't know too much. I thought I knew a lot. I didn't know very much. But anyway, God uh, put it on my heart uh, to better myself. And I heard about the school of Brownville, and I said, well, that's for me. Because uh, I had told myself, I have to go to school to get a piece of paper that says I'm ordained so I can marry him and bury him. That's all I thought I had to have. Because <laughs> I thought I could preach. Because uh, in my books, a good preacher was a strong sermon. A short sermon, but you took a long time to deliver it. That was a good preacher. Uh, so anyway, uh, God put it on me to come here, and of course I didn't have enough education. I smoked like a steam engine, two to three packs of cigarettes a day for 48 years. Well, uh, make a long story short, I got my GED by one point. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next thing was finances. Uh, I got in trouble last time I said this, but money was tight. It was tighter than a fat woman, a small girdle. So, 
So we had to come up with some money, and me being an auctioneer, I told my wife, uh, <laughs> so uh, me being an auctioneer, I told my wife, we're just going to gather everything up, and uh, I'm going to sell this stuff, and we're going to take all this money, and we're going to go to Brownsville, Pensacola, Florida. Well, I had a hard time because it kept saying Brownsville, and my wife said Pensacola. Well, I had two towns, it's all in one town, but big city folks do that to confuse you. But it's all right here. Uh, to make a long story short, I pulled up out here in the parking lot of school. I had a motor home, a three-horse trailer, a pickup with the panels on it, and five head of horses, two dogs, and a cat, and a little tired wife, okay? Uh, and now, uh, Naturally, I'm smoking like a steam engine. I got one cigarette left, and it's 11 o'clock in the morning. School starts at 12. <laughs> at 11.45, I sucked in the last little bit of her. <laughs> and uh, and I, told, uh, I told myself, well, I'm going to run down here and get a pack because I know I can't make it. And uh, I can trick these kids. They'll, they'll never catch me smoking. I can hide. My wife will have pity on me. She knows I'm addicted to this stuff and I'll put enough perfume on, nobody will smell me, and I'll get by with that. Well, sure enough, I run down there, and I reach up, and I said, uh, give me that Marlboro Light 100 right there. And when that lady reached for him, <clears throat> the Holy Ghost said to me, how can you do that to God? He brought you all the way here. Huh, I just put him back. I didn't quit smoking. God delivered me from right then and there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, uh, it's just starting to get good. Uh, like he said, when I was sitting right there and they said Simon in the church, I thought he was talking to me. This church is crowded as right now. And I said, here I am. And Miss Carver, she started crying. She said, that boy got found now. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm down here with these people praying, and a uh, man prayed for me, and uh, I wore hearing aids in school. And I had a bad time. I'd move around because I couldn't hear. Uh, uh, but before I tell you, I want to tell you something. When you ask God for something, ask him for all of it. Don't ask him for a little piece of it. Ask for all of it. Don't ask for a little sandwich when you can have the whole turkey, man. Don't do that. <laughs> so, so anyway, I'm, I'm down here, and the man said, anything you want? And I said, yeah. I said, I can't hear in school. Uh, these hearing aids, the kids are chewing gum and opening notebooks. I just can't hear. And the speakers and everything. If I could just hear my teachers. Well, he put his hands on me and boom, I hit the carpet right there. Head got hot and got black. Uh, nothing happened. Went on home that night, and I had a dream. And when I had an earache, when I was a little boy, my dad used to blow a cigarette smoke in my ear and make it feel better. Well, it felt like he was blowing smoke in my ear, and the smoke went down kind of in my throat, just kind of out of my belly. Well, I woke up and smelled that coffee, man. My wife had the coffee on, but I could hear it running in the pot. And I said, I'm still dreaming. So uh, I get up, wash up, and brush that old head of hair and go in there and sit down and have coffee. And I could hear her pouring that coffee in the cup. And she said, good morning, sounded like she had a bullhorn. <laughs> like it tore my head off. I'll tell you what. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Woo, thank you, Lord. Hey. Yeah. Yeah, I tell you, well, you say it can't get no better. Well, it can. It, it sure does. Uh, then I, get, I realized what loving Jesus really meant and what he had for you. So I went up here in this tank, and I got baptized. And I told them boys now, you know, I'm a little older than these boys. You've been dunking. So uh, when you put me under, hold me a little bit. It's kind of stuck on me like an iron skillet. It's got to soak off a little bit. Uh, and I, anyway, then it dawned on me that these, these prayer team people got little purple badges on. Uh, they pray for you. And uh, boy, God just told me, one of them pups, I call them pups. And these are the big dogs up here on the stage, the big boys. <laughs> and um, I said, man, them pups is powerful now. They can lay a hand on you and heal you just like that, just like them big dogs. Well, when I realized when I said I was Simon sitting there, it dawned on me, God said, you can do that too for me. But you got to clean your hands, boy. 
Well, we got the last soap, the scrub board, and all them school teachers, we got them clean now. And the Holy Ghost, we cleaned up. Well, they let me on the, you know, out there with their puffs, and I get to lay hands on. But I had to understand it wasn't me. God says, you touch them, I'll heal them, and that catcher will bed them. And that's just the way it works. Okay? He ain't going to let you get hurt. He's going to lay you right on the carpet now. So you just take it and absorb every bit of it. And I tell you what, when they have the altar call, it, it's just like your mama baking bread. When you're out working, you can smell that bread of bacon. Man, you run to the house, get the knife, you cut you off a chunk, put a big old chunk of butter and some strawberry jam on there. Well, don't do that here. When you smell it cooking, you come down and get the whole loaf, okay? Don't just take a slice of bread home with you. Take the whole loaf. Thank you now. Appreciate it. I just got one more thing I'd like to say how powerful testimonies can be. Uh, you don't realize when you're in that tank talking because you ain't the Holy Ghost is. You're just moving your mouth and he's doing the talking. Uh, but a week ago, Friday night, right down here was my little area carpet to pray on. And um, we'd prayed for me and my partner, about four people. And a big fella come up, big old boy. And uh, stepped right in front of me and said, Cowboy, you going to pray for me? I said, yes, sir. Sure, I'll be glad to. Big boy now. So when I reached up to touch his forehead, he just grabbed my hand. And he said, you're going to hear my testimony first. I said, be glad to. <laughs> you know, I'm here to please, boy. So anyhow, he said, Monday night, he lived over here in uh, Georgia. And he said, Monday night, I was standing in my front room, mad at my wife, had a 45 pistol to my head to hammer cock. I was going to blow my brains all over her in that front room. And she said, wait one minute said, all she done was turn around, and you believe she turned on the television. And he said, I watched your testimony. He said, I laid that gun down, cowboy. You're going to pray for me? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. You know, at the school, we're absolutely convinced that if we can get Cowboy to overcome his shyness <laughs> and learn to punctuate his messages with some vivid illustrations, <laughs> if we can come overcome those two weaknesses, he'll make a great preacher. <laughs> so come on this way. Why don't you just... Um, Share with me what's happened with the two of you. It just, just let us know what God has done um, in, in, in your marriage, in your personal lives as well. Okay. Um, we were college sweethearts, and uh, in the 70s, we last saw each other. And 1990, we saw each other again. It wasn't under good circumstances. We were in a bar uh, in the world. Hadn't, I'd been in church growing up, but was never saved. We got married. And uh, she didn't know who she married. When we got married, I was selling cocaine, doing cocaine. That was my entire life. And she helped me stop. And we moved to a different location, started a business together. And Anna and I were married for four years. And she found out I was a monster of iniquity. And we got divorced in 1994. And after we got divorced in uh, May, Anna got saved around Christmas. And... I went back to the same lifestyle I had been in after we were divorced and continued for a couple of more years. And in March of 96, I got saved. And in June... Can I say something? Yes. Um, this is a long way around, but when, when we did get back together and God put us back together, when we started talking about the times and the dates and what happened, I realized that when he got saved, it was about two weeks before he got saved when, I, when God revealed to me that I hadn't truly forgiven him. And when I truly forgave him, we came up with the, the dates and everything. That It was about two weeks after that that he got saved. Do, do you feel the forgiveness that you released had anything to do with God being able to work in his life? Yes, I do. Um, the day that I got saved, I had come to a point in my life that I 
I hated myself. I hated everything, everybody. Um, I lived just to, I couldn't get high anymore. I couldn't get drunk. I could just get to a state where I could exist. And the day before I got saved, I woke up with one thought on my mind. And I thought, if I don't find a way to live life today, there won't be a tomorrow. The next day, the Holy Spirit met me in a church service. I had talked to the pastor for an hour, and all he could tell me was, if you're saved, you're so far backslidden, I don't know what we're going to do. I've never seen anybody this bad. But if you're not, you make Jesus Lord of your life instead of you being Lord of your life, and everything will change. And he didn't, I didn't really do anything then, but in the church service, God did speak to me. And I did tell him, if you want it, you can have it. I've messed up everything in life I've touched. Jesus, if I go on from here, it's with you. And I had an experience like Saul of Tarsus. I got born again. Um, I, I was living with another guy in an RV. We were selling drugs. His nickname was Hitman. And uh, my father came to me and allowed me to come live with him for a while. He said, you don't need to go back there. And all I knew was I had a reason for living in hope. And on June... Two, uh, about two or three months after I got saved, Anna had called my parents to talk to them, and they weren't there, and I answered the phone. And I had been praying because I had a pastor who knew her, who was my pastor, before he knew me. And Anna had taught his daughter gymnastics, and he had been asking me if there was a possibility of us getting back together. And I told him Anna didn't want to speak to me. I hadn't spoken to her in over three years, and it was impossible. But he told me to pray. And I read in uh, 1 Corinthians 7 where Paul said, uh, instructions, if a woman, uh, a woman and her husband are not to separate, if they do, she's supposed to remain unmarried or reconcile with her husband. And the husband's not supposed to divorce his wife. So I felt like that was a word from the Lord. If I was to ever be married again, it should be Anna or remain single. Every day I prayed as this pastor told me to, if it's your will, Lord, reconcile us. And I didn't have any hope of anything. I didn't really have any expectation. I was... Happy, growing in the Lord alone. And uh, June, when she called, when I answered the phone, I didn't recognize her voice. And when she hung up, I sat thinking who it was. And it dawned on me after a couple of minutes, it was Anna. And I said, well, thank you, Lord. I knew that was the answer. We're not going to get back together because she knew she was calling my parents' house and I was there. And she called back about five minutes later. And she apologized for hanging up. And we talked for the first time in over two years, and we talked for an hour. And it wasn't anything in the natural that really meant anything. It was really just facts, facts, and real cold. But when we got off the phone, the Holy Spirit said, I'm putting you back together, but you got to keep your mouth shut about it. So he told you that, that you, that you just... Why do you think he said you had to keep your mouth shut about it? Uh, well, I run it too much, and... I have a tendency to get ahead of God when, I, when he shows me something I want to go do instead of waiting on his time. So God was just teaching you to wait on him and to trust him through this whole thing. What was he doing in your life? Um, well, when I called, I just, and I knew it was Bruce, and I knew there was a possibility that he would be there, but I had no desire in my heart whatsoever to talk to him. And, um, so so at, that, at that time when you're saying that, you, you did not have any no. desire to get back with him? No. I had absolutely prayed against that. I mean, I was like, Lord, please don't ever make me go back to this man, which should have told me something there, you know, like I was already doing something. But when I talked to him, um, and I just hung up the phone in a hurry, then the Holy Spirit just came on me, and it said, you can't do this. You have to at least talk to him, you know. And so I picked up the phone, and I called him back, and then we talked for a long time. But it still didn't do anything as far as my love or desire to have any reconciliation or anything. So. All right, then, then what happened from there? Um, basically, we didn't talk. We may have written once, and that was uh, June of 96. In August of 96, God called me to the ministry, but it was just, I want you to work for me, but you have to be trained. I didn't really know what to do. January of 97, uh, from listening to men, I was going back to college and then going to seminary. I went through a semester of school, and that summer I saw a tape of the revival here. The day I got saved was the day that they had the ninth month celebration here. And when I saw that, I knew I had to come here. In August, I went back to the school I was at. At the end of the first week, I came here for a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday just to come check out the revival. And God called me to the school on Sunday. And uh, it was a day that Klaus Kugler was here, gave his testimony, and had all the students. But the school was starting on Tuesday, and I was in another school. 
But God just worked miracles. The church I was at gave me all the money Sunday night. Monday I withdrew. Tuesday I came. Got here at 9.30. At 10.30 I was in the school. Then Anna, Anna knew that I was here, I think. In September, pastor called me out. He's only prayed for me twice. I didn't know. She says no. no. She didn't know I was here. No. I had been wanting to come to revival for over a year and a half because I had friends whose sons had been radically changed in the revival. And I knew it was God, and I knew I had to come. And um, so every time I made plans to come, something would happen, and I couldn't come. And so I was like, Lord, I, I'm just, I'm coming, I'm going. And then when uh, the times we really got everything together, and the Lord spoke to me and said, you can't go. Not now, because when you go, I'm going to change your life forever. And so I had to wait. So um, in early September, right after I'd, I'd been in school for less than a month, pastor called me out during prayer one night. And he asked me, uh, he, he called a woman, and he said, is that your wife? I said, no, sir. He said, well, where is your wife? I told him, I said, I don't have one. He said, why not? I said, I was divorced before I was saved. And he started praying for me, and he prophesied over me. And I was saying, God, I can't do this. He's got the wrong guy. The next day, I, I really believe Pastor, I believe the Holy Spirit told him to pray for him and his wife. That's why he called a woman. But the next day, the Holy Spirit told me to call Anna. And I hadn't talked to her since been over a year. And I had her number, but an aunt had given it to me, Anna hadn't. And I just dismissed the thought. I said, I'm, she didn't give me a number. I'm not calling her. And that night in the service, right before Steve preached, somebody I'd only seen once came up to me and gave me a message that she had called at a place I used to live. And I called her, and I left at 4 o'clock the next morning to go back to Mississippi, and I saw her for the first time in over three years. And uh, I knew when I saw her and talked to her, she was not the same person at all. God had done a mighty thing in her life. What, what had he done in your life to that point? Um, he had radically just gotten a hold of me. I, he said he was a monster of iniquity, and I was ten times the monster of iniquity. Um, a lot of people saw on the outside his sin, but I hid mine so deeply that nobody really saw the person I really was. And I had lived a double life for a long time. Um, I had lived an immoral life, and I destroyed the lives of my children through abortions. And God had reached down and just loved me and picked me up and showed me total forgiveness and taught me that he loved me and that... Um, that I was worth something because he died for me. And, and so that made me want to reach out to other women, and I went through a lot of counseling and stuff, and then I started helping counsel. But, you know, God had just um, done such a work in my life that I had to talk to um, his parents because I was going to do um, a program on a radio station, and I knew they listened to it. And I wanted to tell them myself what I had done because they desperately wanted grandchildren, and I was the one who destroyed the lives of their grandchildren. And so I had to talk to them face to face and tell them what I had done. And so he met me, and that was the most precious thing because I never thought that he would do that. I really, I mean, I knew he was saved, I knew he loved the Lord, and I knew all that, but for him to leave school and come all the way, you know, to Mississippi to meet me, just to stand by my side, to talk to his parents was just something that I couldn't fathom. I mean, it was just incredible. And the old man would have never done anything like that. So he was. Okay, tell us, tell us quickly then, how did, how did he put you back together? Um, on October 31st of 97, Anna and two women came to the revival, to visit the revival. And that night, during prayer, he told Anna that we were getting back together. He still wouldn't let me. I was begging all day, Lord, let me say something. This is not right. The woman doesn't say something. He told me to keep my mouth shut. She talked to me that night and told me what the Lord had told her in prayer. So we talked. I had been talking with Scott Brown at the school, and they have rules. You have to wait so many days and get married in the break. And we were making plans. In the meantime, her family found out that we were getting remarried. And they tried to physically take her by force once when we went to Mississippi. She still had the business we started. And when she gave it to some other people, they tried to take her by force and didn't through her prayers that night. And then they got a court order in Mississippi to have her put in a mental institution. And they were in the process of getting that here. And we had to talk to leadership of the school and at the church one night. And they told us the only remedy was if we were ready to go ahead and get married, that it was spiritual warfare. It would take the weapon out of the enemy's hands. So November 17th, we got remarried here in Pensacola. Praise the Lord.
Praise the Lord. Amen. One thing that the Lord has really laid on my heart about all this is when I actually came back and said that I would marry him, it wasn't out of the ushy gushy love. It was out of obedience to God. And I want to tell you something. The Lord has given me so much love for this man. And I prayed, Lord, teach me to love him. Let me love him like you love him and like you want me to love him. And see, God did that. He gave me more love. I never had the love that I have for him now then. You know, he didn't give me back my husband. He gave me a new man who is the priest of my household who loves me more than I can even tell you. And God will give you that love for your husband if you ask him to. Praise the Lord. One last thing. What's he done in your heart toward her? I didn't know what marriage was. We lived together. We coexisted. I didn't know what love was. It was a long time after I got saved before I even could stand myself. But he gave me a love for her and a concern for her as, as one flesh, as it says in the Bible, and a desire to care for her and protect her. And she is the queen. I tell the guys, I have to go pick her up from work at 730 every night and leave here. And I tell the guards, I'm going to get the most wonderful woman in the world. And I mean it. Hallelujah. Thank you. Praise God. Yes. Uh, Ryan has, uh, Ryan Bruss has been a part of establishing uh, Friday Night Outreach, and uh, it's a powerful outreach. You have how, how many going out? About about 150 to 175 every Friday night. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you just uh, bring these forward that are, these are two working in the outreach and, and what's taking place. You might share just a moment of what, what's taking place in the outreach and then let them uh, give their testimony. I think before you do that, though, that every one of us, you are now on the inside of the Brown household and you probably know some stuff <laughs> that, that we don't know. And, uh, you know, if you want to take a moment, just to, all right. <laughs> well, this is what really happens behind the scenes. <laughs> now, God is so good. We have, uh, like uh, Pastor Phillips said, we have between 150, 175 going out every Friday night. And we have upwards around 100 every Saturday night. The reason why we started a Saturday night outreach is because a number of the people that we had been seeing on Friday night weren't there anymore. So we started a Saturday night outreach, and that's how we're reaching those who uh, wouldn't come on Friday night on the streets. But we're seeing so many things happen. So I can tell you stories that would make you weep and stories that would make you shout. I'm ready to weep now myself. God is so good. He, if you want to see what is really going on in America, check out the streets. And uh, I could, we, just a couple quick things. Our students, we saw, there was a guy going by on his bike. I don't remember if it was a guy or a girl. Someone going by on their bike, and our students stopped them, and, and that person was on his way to commit suicide. And our students ministered to him the love of the Lord, and, and he turned back and went the other way, you know, in the love of Christ. And uh, I, recently, I met a multi-millionaire turned homeless because his wife had died, and he turned an alcoholic. And you could just tell by the way he carried himself and by his demeanor that, you know, he, he just want, he's a learned man. And uh, he is now living with rats and with other homeless people. So these are the kind of people you find on the streets. I've met a number of backslidden preachers on the streets going into the bars. You know, everybody's a Christian on the streets. Everybody, whether they're smoking dope or whether they got the beer in their hand, they're a Christian. And uh, that's where we hit. We hit that right on the head because everybody's a Christian. I remember one time right down the street here, I talked to a gentleman going into the strip club. I said, hey, I yelled out to him, hey, and he turned around. I said, you know that Jesus loves you and he's watching you. And he knows what you're doing when you go in. He goes, ha, you know, I'll go home tonight. I'll repent. Everything will be okay. And so that's the attitude of many people on the streets. But God is moving. And we're seeing so many souls saved, we can hardly keep up with it. We had, there was a testimony in the baptism the other day, Friday night, of a guy that was set free and saved. And, uh, you know, just so many things happening. The fruit of, of what we're seeing. It would be different if all these students were going out and nothing was happening. 
But things are happening and God is moving. And as Steve has said, revival, true revival is when it hits the streets. And we just have a couple of testimonies here from uh, Julian and Shannon uh, from the last couple of weeks. And uh, they would like to share. Well, praise the Lord. I'm so happy. <laughs> I can't stop smiling. Anyways, I can't believe I'm up here. <laughs> I'm always watching Brownsville videos. Never thought I'd ever be up here. But anyways, praise the Lord. Um, well, I'm going to the School of Ministry. This is my first year, my first semester. So um, anyways, I can make that into a long story. But well, I started the first Friday night of going out and witnessing. It was the first Friday night. It was my first time ever witnessing. So I'm kind of, to be honest, I was kind of in, you know, didn't have the boldness, you know, I didn't really know what to do, and everybody's like, don't worry, because the first time, you just kind of want to stay behind and pray. So I'm like, all right, that doesn't sound so bad, I can do that. Well, we, I was with a group of kids, and I'm praying about this, I can never remember names, I have a hard time, so excuse me if I don't remember the names, but I think they're Chris and Aaron. And I can't remember the other kid's name. Okay. Okay. So anyways, well, um, well, we went to the projects behind this church or in the side of this church. We went to the projects just down the road. And um, we were walking up, and there was a bunch of kids on the porch between the age of 8 to 18. And um, the guys started talking to the guys. And I'm sitting here, and I'm like, all I have to do is pray. I'm like, look at these girls sitting here. I'm like, no. I'm like, I have to say something, you know. So I went up to them, and I thought, you know, instead of just saying something right away about Jesus, I'm going to say something to try to get their attention, you know, try to figure out what they have in common. So I asked them, I asked them if they like to sing, because I love to sing. And so they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, cool. So I thought, you know, we'll sing a couple of Jesus songs. So I'm like, do you know Jesus loves me? And they're like, yeah. Well, they didn't sing with me. I had to sing it. And their little sister, their little eight-year-old sister, just precious, precious little thing, came running out the door. You can sing. You can sing. I'm like, yeah. And I said, do you know Jesus loves me? She's like, yeah, yeah. Can I sing it with you? And I'm like, of course, you know. So we both started singing Jesus loves me the whole night. <laughs> just the whole night. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. And it was so awesome. But, um, off in the distance, it was getting, this is about probably two hours later, um, there was a kid named Chris, and he was telling these group of guys, they're about 18, you know, 17, and his testimony. And so after a while, I'm like, okay, girls, you know, let's, let's go over there and see what they're doing, you know. So we walked over there, and the, he, Chris is telling his testimony, and he asked them if, you know, if they want to accept the Lord Jesus as their Savior. And they're like, yeah, you know, that sounds really cool, but, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so we all grabbed hands, me and the girls, and we all got down on our knees on the ground, even in front of some of their friends that didn't want to participate. But um, it was so awesome. It was so awesome. And I know each and every one of them meant it. But afterwards, even before the, that time, this little girl just, I can't explain it. The love... I just was giving her so much love, and I, it wasn't me. I, I think it was just, you know, Jesus with, you know, I don't know how you say that, but I just felt so much love for this girl, and she didn't understand why I couldn't adopt her. She wanted me to adopt her, and she had a mom, and she's just like, oh, I love you so much. I want to be with you, and I was just like, she goes, can't you adopt me? Can't you adopt me? And I'm like, no, I can't, you know, and, but anyways, so we're all down on our knees, and we get up. And um, this little girl, her name was Jasmine, the eight-year-old girl, and she came up to me, and she tapped me on the shoulder, and she's like, Jolene, and I said, yeah? She goes, can I tell you something? And I'm like, sure. And you could tell at first she was kind of hesitant, because it kind of seemed like she didn't know if I would believe her or not. But she whispered in my ear, she goes, when I had my eyes closed, I seen this really, really, really bright light brighter than, you know, she can imagine. And there was this guy coming, to, this man coming towards her in this long coat carrying this stick. And I'm like, <laughs> I wanted just to scream and just praise the Lord, but I didn't want to, you know, freak this little girl out, you know, and I'm like, go tell them, go <laughs> tell them. But it was so awesome, you know, and it just shows how much Jesus loves the little children. And I mean, 
it's right behind this church. It is right behind this church. You know, these people just need the love of Jesus. And it is so awesome. But, Praise the Lord. Thank you. I'm going to tell you about a couple different people that we ran into, into the, in the field. And uh, one is his name was John. And uh, he's a homeless guy, and he lives down here on the streets of Pensacola. And uh, we walked up to John, the group that I was with, and uh, uh, one of the girls just asked him if he wanted to be set free from alcohol because he was just drunk. He was pu pushing a, a bicycle along, and he was just barely holding himself up. And uh, we just, she asked him if he wanted to be set free from alcohol, and he was just, no way. He backed off. And so we just started talking to him for a while, and then we just asked if we could pray for him. And uh, when we did, when we prayed for him, the power of God came down. And, I mean, he dropped his bike, and one of us caught it, and then we just kept on praying for him, and just, the Lord just came down. He just started lifting his arms up to heaven and just started praising God. And... Uh, the Lord just, the Lord sobered him up right in front of us. I mean, he was totally drunk. He was completely sober. We prayed for him at three different occasions within about an hour's time. I mean, he was really open. We led him to the Lord the second, the second time. And on, on the third time, it was like something just lifted right off of his back. And he, he looked at me and he said, you know, you see this bike? And it was a real heavy, you know, uh, like a Baja bike type deal. And he was telling me that he had a burden that he's been carrying around on his back that's bigger than this bike. And he said, and it's gone, wow. you know. And this guy was not schooled at all. He was in Vietnam, and he was given a Bible in Nam, and that's the most he ever knew about God. And he didn't really, he read the Bible a little bit. And he said, uh, the other thing he did is he kind of, he was looking at his hands, and he kept on looking at them. And he said, I've been on morphine, and I've been on all kinds of other drugs when I was in Nam, but I've been on nothing that feels like this. I mean, he just... He was set free right in front of our eyes. And then there was, a, just, just last week even, there was a, a young guy that, that even if they're, when they do say that they're a Christian, one thing that I encourage is to ask them that you could even like disciple them and teach them more about the Lord. You don't have to go against what they're saying or anything, but just encourage them that you would like to just spend some time with him, bring him into your, your house or meet him at a restaurant or something and just teach him the word. And uh, there's a young guy and I, told, I asked him if, he would want to, if he'd be willing to do this. And two days later, he called me up and, uh, and I met him over at Burger King. And when I went in there, and I, just, I just started going through the word. I just started describing to him about, about the Lord and, and just the salvation and uh, found out that he, he thought he was a Christian, but he wasn't. And uh, when I just went through the scriptures, he just started crying, you know, and he just really, he wanted to learn more, and he wanted to accept the Lord into his heart, and, and he did that night. But it was very powerful. I want, I want to ask you one, one question. Do you, uh, Ryan, as you as well, do you see people's hearts really open, uh, that, that, that they're open to hear and to receive, uh, even though they're going into the bars and they're, they're just on the streets? Well, since I've been, I went all last semester out, and then this semester I've been going out Friday and Saturdays. And uh, last Friday night we had an all-night prayer meeting. And I've, from every time, it's just been, sometimes you have a divine appointments and other times you just really fought. And last Saturday night, that, right after that Friday night all-night prayer meeting, it was absolutely incredible. We had people coming to us. I mean, guys bringing his friend, like telling him, telling me, uh, tell him what you were telling me. I mean, and people just were just, it was incredible. I've never seen anything like it, but it was just like a, like we just raked in a harvest. And everybody, I was packed full of tracks, and I normally, I'm not somebody that hands out tracks, but, uh, but we were just giving out the phone numbers. You know, we just wanted something to write on, so we started giving out phone numbers, and we just, we lot, I mean, we were gone. We were had, didn't have any more tracks, and we were just having to rip up pieces of paper just to give out numbers, and and call so we can give out our numbers and get their numbers. But. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Just, uh, just one more thing along that line is, uh, I believe it's Acts 16. They are literally coming to us and saying, what must I do to be saved? Literally saying those exact words, just coming right up to us. And, and 
you would not believe what we've been seeing through that, the miracles, healings, and the power of God just coming down strong. And uh, the, the key to effectiveness on the streets is this, nothing more than seeing the real people on the streets, seeing the realness of Christ in you. They've seen it. They've, been, they've, been, they've seen the, pre oh, I know those guys at Brownsville. Oh, I know those guys. You know, they say that. But until they see and meet the realness of the gospel, that's what's drawing the people in. Amen. Praise God. Let's. <clears throat> God's moving everywhere. He's changing marriages. He'll touch you tonight. And these testimonies are just a part of what God is saying to encourage everyone in this place tonight that God is here, he's real, and he's working on the streets, and he's working in the church, and he wants to touch us deeper than we've ever been touched and to change whatever is necessary. Let's, let's stand together. Thank you, Jesus. How many of you are in a big hurry? How many of you have something better to do than to hear the word? We're good. The Lord's going to speak. We're just going to open our hearts to the Lord now. Not only we have a song now, but we're not going to. We've gone on a bit with the testimonies, and I want to dive right in. But I don't know where you fit in the spectrum of things. You may be a minister of the gospel and consider yourself very serious, and you may be. Maybe some friends brought you in here, and you're desperately trying to get out, and you thought the service was over seven times already, and we're still just getting going. Maybe you came in here with a desperate need. Maybe you're bound and you know it and you want to be set free and you've come from around the world or maybe from around the block because you heard that God was moving here. I tell you, whoever you are, God's about to speak to you. He's about to meet you. If you'll open your heart, if you'll respond, if you'll put your defenses down and let the Holy Spirit speak, you'll be changed. I've had the privilege of preaching around the world and preaching at many major meetings, but these revival services are especially sacred to us. In three and a half years in revival, there have only been three nights, this being the third, that Steve is not here. I take this very seriously, and I know that God is about to meet you. So I want you to close your eyes. I want you to open your heart to God. Father, I ask you in Jesus' name now that your word would come forth with power, with clarity, that it'll be, Lord, like a hammer that shatters the rock in pieces, like a fire that melts the coldest heart that it'll pierce, Lord, be sharper than any two-edged sword, Lord, that it'll be a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Gracious Father, that it'll be a tree of life to all that take hold of it. God, speak to us tonight. God, meet us tonight. God, change every single one here. Everyone watching at home, everyone listening on the Internet, change every life radically. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. You can be seated. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I want to tell you a story, though, before I get started. Those of you who are time conscious, I want you to know that I'm very time sensitive. And in fact, you can look at your watches right now. Everybody look, see exactly what time it is. From the moment I start reading the scriptures, you can time it precisely, okay? So you look at your watch. The moment I start reading from 1 Corinthians 9, you can start looking at that clock. And the precise moment I am finished, I'll stop. All right? I've gotten to preach in a lot of different settings, and I'm used to a lot of different cultures. Many, many I don't know at all, of course. But I love the different cultures and the different expressions in the body. I'm Jewish, come from a different background myself, didn't grow up in church. One time, it was about 12, 13 years ago, I was preaching in basically an all-black church, all-African-American church in Washington, D.C. And even though I've got a decent education and can lecture in seminaries and do that kind of thing, my preaching is as simple and clear as can possibly be. In fact, once I get into this message, you'll wish it was not so clear. You'll wish there was something you didn't understand, but you will understand. Well, I'm in the middle of preaching, and I hear a voice from behind me on the platform, some brothers sitting there on the platform. I'm preaching my message, and I hear somebody say, make it plain. 
But make it plain. I'm making it as plain as I know how to make it. I'm being as simple as I know how to be. I'm being as clear as I know. I better simplify this message even more. So I bring it down even more. Make it even more simple. And a few minutes later, I hear someone else yell, make it plain. At this point, I thought, I don't know how to make it any more plain. <clears throat> I don't know what else to do. And then being a very smart man, very brilliant, very attentive, probably about 20 minutes, a half hour into it, I realized that make it plain was their way of saying, amen, preach it, brother. <laughs> so I didn't know I wasn't used to that culture. It caught me off guard. But ever since then, when I told that story in the revival, we developed a little saying up here on the platform where we'll say make it plain, and that's exactly what we mean. We don't mean it in the right way that those folks were using it in that church. We, may, we mean the way that we use it in this church, which is make it plain. So I promise tonight to make it plain. Is that all right? Yeah. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. This is efficient here, man. I put a handkerchief in my pocket. Charlie put a handkerchief up here. Now I can really preach. Anyone need a handkerchief? Didn't bring one? You were praying that God would supply one? Anybody? Be honest. This could be your miracle. Anybody? Right over here? Okay. Josh, could you deliver this? God bless you. I hope this is not all you get tonight, though. These are fresh, not used yet. One night I was praying for people at the end of the service, you know, going and laying hands on people as we do, and I was sweating, and, and, and uh, somebody went and handed me a handkerchief. Sometimes a catcher or a helper will do it. They went and handed me a handkerchief, and I just, just smiled and thanked and took my glasses off, and they said, that's, that's a prayer cloth. We want you to pray over that. First Corinthians chapter 9. Paul writing, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training or exercises self-control in all things. They do it to get a crown that will not last but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified, namely disqualified for the prize. If you know anything about the ancient Greek world, you know that that's where the Olympics come from. And right outside the city of Corinth, just a few miles away, there were major games, the Isthmian Games. They held every two years. They were almost important as the Olympics. It was a big event. People would come flocking from everywhere. Athletes would have to go into 10 months of training before the games or they'd be disqualified from even competing. And they had racing, running. They had wrestling. They had jumping. They had boxing. They had hurling the javelin. They had throwing the discus, those six principal sports. And it was a big festivity, and there'd be big gatherings of art, and there would be a re religious occasion. And they were used to this concept of athletes. They were used to this concept of people being in a race. And Paul draws on that to speak to the Corinthians about how they should live for God. Now let me say something before I get right into the heart of this. The reason that America is in such a mess today is because the church is in a mess. The reason that America is so aimless, is, is, is the reason America doesn't know which way is right, the reason that America can tolerate so much sin and just wink at all kinds of evil, the reason that America can legally abort 30 million babies in 25 years, the reason America could have this massive thriving pornography industry and drug industry and alcohol industry and export smut and shame around the world, the reason that we're in this shape is because the church in our midst is asleep. The problem begins here. The problem begins with us. 
And, and one of the great reasons, and this is not just America, but America has so many tens of millions of professing Christians that it's an even greater shame. But one of the reasons that the church is in such a mess is because we are riddled with spiritual birth defects. In other words, people were not properly born into the kingdom of God. Our foundations were messed up. We may be saved. We may have our sins forgiven. If we die, we might be heaven bound. But many of us have faulty spiritual foundations. It was James Edwin Orr, who was the great revival scholar, who made the statement, the only proof of the new birth is the new life. And he's the one that also pointed out that when people weren't born again right, look in the natural, someone has a birth defect and they're handicapped and weaken all their lives. In the same way, those of us who did not come into the kingdom of God are right, have faulty foundations. For many people, they responded to a convenience gospel. What's in it for me kind of thing? Jesus can help me out of a mess. Jesus can fix my problems. Jesus can be the big brother I never had. And he is the big brother you never had. And he can fix your problems. And he can bring you out of a mess. But he's not here to make a deal with you. He's not here to say, tell you what, I'll do this for you if you do this for me. He said, you die to your old life and you live for me. I'm Lord, period. That's it. That's the gospel. There was a gangster named Mickey Cohn who got saved in the 50s. He heard Billy Graham preach and resisted the message. Then someone talked to him and quoted him from Revelation 3.20, how Jesus stands at the door and knocks the words of Jesus to the church of Laodicea. And this man decided he's going to open up the door and let Jesus in. But then some weeks went by, some months went by, and, and his Christian friends noticed he was still living the same way. He was still involved in his gangsterism. He was still involved in his illegal activities. He was still involved in his sinful living. So this fellow began to talk to Mickey Cohn, and Mickey Cohn got angry. You see, he had heard about Christian actors and actresses. He had even heard some of them testify. And he had heard about Christian cowboys and cowgirls. We heard from a Christian cowboy tonight. And he had heard about... Christian athletes, Christian stars, Christian politicians, he thought he could be a Christian gangster. And he said to the friend, you never told me I had to give up my business, meaning all my illegal activities. You never told me I had to give up my friends, meaning all the sinful people I'm hanging out with doing sinful things. He didn't understand that to be born again meant to go from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. It meant you no longer served yourself, you no longer served this world, you no longer served the devil, you no longer served sin. Now you serve God, period. No option, no middle ground. Jesus said you cannot serve two masters. Before we were saved, we were slaves of the devil. We did his bidding. We fulfilled the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Many of us threw ourselves wholeheartedly into sin. Now that we're saved, it's not just that we're forgiven so we can go on sinning. It's not that God pardons the rebel while the rebel remains in rebellion. No, Jesus says if anyone, listen to me, these are reliable words. They come from Jesus. This is not somebody's opinion of what he said. This is not my interpretation of what he said. These are his words. Jesus said, if anyone wants to follow me, anyone includes you, anyone includes me, anyone includes male, includes female, young, old. If anyone wants to follow me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus said, unless you forsake everything you have, you can't be my disciple. Jesus said, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever won't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He didn't mince words. He didn't make deals. He was the son of God who spilled his blood for the sins of this world. He came down from his father's throne to give himself for us, for wicked, foul, miserable, ungrateful sinners. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the love of God. He doesn't have to make some deal with us. It, it, it would be like a beauty queen 
going to a bum on the street and saying, I'd like to take you into my home and I'd like our folks to rehabilitate you and when you're strong and on your feet, I want to marry you. And he says, tell you what, I'll do it for you if you let me have my drinking and my old girlfriends too. Picture at a wedding. As the vows are being exchanged, that suddenly the groom says, whoa, whoa, what? wait one second here. You didn't tell me I was going to have to give up everybody else. You didn't tell me I was going to have to give up all my other loves and all my other interests. You didn't tell me I was going to have to make a lifetime commitment. You'd say, what, is that insanity? Nobody can even fathom it. But somehow we think we can come to an altar, ask Jesus to forgive us and wash us and cleanse us and still live our old lives and still make our own decisions as to where we're going in our future and still decide how we're going to spend our time. Where did we get that notion from? See, it's, it's kind of a shocking thing when we go back to the New Testament gospel. It's all grace. It's all the mercy of God. We can't save ourselves. We can't earn us by works. God graciously reaches down his hand and picks us up out of the muck and the mire. But you do a study through the New Testament. And you'll find that Jesus is called Savior in the entire New Testament less than 20 times. He's called Lord more than 700 times. The Lord Jesus is coming to take account of his own tonight. The Lord Jesus is looking through this place at my life and every life here at everyone that calls him Lord He's taking account of his own. The master is taking inventory in the lives of his servants. And friend, let me tell you this. The word tells us that we're all going to stand before God and give account. Those here that don't know the Lord, your sins are not forgiven. If you don't receive mercy from him, that day will be your worst nightmare and it will never end forever. You'll be cast out of God's presence guilty instead of receiving his mercy. And everyone here that says, I know Jesus is Lord, I'm saved, my sins are forgiven, I know it. I want you to know the word tells us plainly in several scriptures that we will all give account of our lives. I want to hold the mirror up for you tonight, the mirror of the word that James talks about, so you can examine your own life against the word. So you don't have to wait for that judgment day when it all comes out. You don't have to wait for that day when you, you'd wish you could take it back and you wish you'd live differently and you wished you'd taken the opportunities that God gave you and you wished you'd crucify the flesh and you'd wish you'd been obedient, but it'd be too late then when you look back and have God's perspective and say, I can't believe I wasted all these years. I can't believe I resisted the call. I can't believe I gave in to the flesh. I can't believe that heaven was not real to me and hell was not real to me. It'll be too late then. I want to help you tonight to look at your own life against the Word of God. And if God speaks to you when this message is over, I urge you to respond. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're a worker in the church here. If God speaks to you, I want you to respond. If you're in off the street and you're just waiting for a polite moment when I take a breath so you can walk out, the polite moment's not coming. I'm after you. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Paul's talking here. Other scriptures speak of it. Hebrews 12 tells us to run our race with perseverance. The word calls us to a walk. The word calls us to a journey. I want to ask you something tonight. Paul's talking to people who are training for the games. Paul's talking to people who are in a race. Let me ask you something honestly before God. I don't care what people think about you. I don't care what your reputation is, good or bad. Between you and God, I want to know what is the race that you are in. I want to know, why are you here on this earth? Jesus not only saves us from something, he saves us to something. The word says that we have died to sin so that we can live to righteousness. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father. Let me ask you something. Before God, are you in a race? 
Some of you here, if I look at your life, you'll tell me, man, I'm consumed with making a buck. Everything in me, if I sat down and said, tell me about your race. Tell me what you live for. Tell me what you dream about. Tell me what you're running after. Tell me what you're moving for. Tell me the whole thrust and focus of your life. Where is it going? For some that call themselves children of God, your life is going the way of the world. Oh, you may be a better person than you were before, and maybe you pray a little and read the Word each day, but the race that you're in is a worldly race. You should be able to stop and look at your life. You know, Paul articulated the whole purpose of his life. You look at servants of God, men and women that God's used. They were driven. There was one thing they lived for, one thing they breathed for, one thing they wanted to see. You can talk to Steve Hill any day of the week. He'll tell you, I live for, to please Jesus, personal holiness and winning the loss, personal holiness and winning the loss. That's the race I'm on. What are you running after? What are you going after? What are you living for? In your heart of hearts, what's the God that you worship? What is it that you love with all your heart? What is it that consumes you? People say, oh, praise the Lord, it's Jesus. I wonder, is it really Jesus? Are you really running that race? Can you tell me, can you boil it down to one simple sentence and say, the whole purpose of my life is this. The whole purpose of my life is to glorify God by touching the lost. The whole purpose of my life is to bring a ministry of compassion to those who are hurt. The whole purpose of my life is to be a man or woman of prayer and intercession. The whole purpose of my life is to take the gospel to those who never heard. The whole purpose of my life is to bring healing and deliverance to the captives. The whole purpose of my life is to worship and glorify God. What's the purpose of your life? Where are you going? Some here are not even in a race. You're trying to get God to bless you. You're trying to get God to help you. You're trying to get God to change you. But you're not even in a race. There's no purpose to your life. There's no focus to your life. You can even be in ministry, and ministry is just the job that dominates your life. What are you living for? Where are you going? What are your sights set on? What is it that if I, if I saw you one year later, you're still moving on that path, and five years later, you're still moving, you're still running in that race? Are you in the race at all? You know, it's a funny thing. Some of us, before we were saved, were running a race for the devil. Some of us, before we were saved, we had an agenda. We had plans. We had demonic things we were doing. You know, I was a heavy drug user, and I loved being a heavy drug user. And I was proud of being a heavy drug user, and shooting dope and taking mega doses of LSD and mescaline and all this kind of stuff. I was proud of it. I played drums. I want to be a rock drummer. I want to be a heavily drugged sinful rock drum. And I was moving towards that. Every day of my life, I was putting drugs into my system as best as I could. Every day of my life, I was practicing with my band and playing. Every day, listening to that music because I was going somewhere. Some of you were like that. You were, you were getting up in the crime industry or you were getting up in the secular world or you were, you were going to be this top athlete or this top star, but it was with sin and with compromise. And now you get saved and what happens? We just become these harmless, spineless, lovely Christians. We had an aggression before. We had a passion before. We had a vision before. Now we get saved and we're just like, oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. A fellow I went to college with switched over to another college, a major Christian college. And he couldn't believe there were Christians everywhere, believers everywhere. We had been in a secular college in New York together and did a lot of witnessing. Get together with believers once every week or two and we'd read the word and pray together and so on and try to reach the lost. Now he's at a place where everybody's Christian. And I remember he told me he was so frustrated. He sat down across the table in the cafeteria and said, you're a Christian, praise the Lord. They said, yeah, pass the salt. It was just... Yeah, we're all Christians. Well, we're getting a good Christian education. We'll be good Christian businessmen, a Christian artist, a Christian this, or Christian parents. Or Christ but there was, that was just being a normal person in this world and sprinkling a little Jesus on it. Let me tell you something. Jesus did not spill his blood just so you can occupy space here until you get to heaven. Jesus didn't redeem you so that now you can have a blessed life with a blessed family and a blessed home and a blessed business while the world goes to hell around you. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5 that Jesus died for us. And we died with him to sin. Now we who live, what does it say? Should no longer live for ourselves but for him who died for us and rose from the dead. You may not be called, quote, into ministry, 
And even that distinction is a non-biblical distinction because according to Ephesians 4, God put apostles and prophets and evangelists, pastors and teachers in the church to equip everybody else to go and do the work of ministry. If you're saved, you're called to do the work of God. If you're saved, you now have a master who's giving you orders. What is the purpose of your life? Where are you going? What's the focus? What's the direction? What's the dream? I've said for years that what the world calls fanaticism and most of the church calls extremism, God calls normal. Jesus never rescinded the first and greatest commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. He never rescinded that. Let me tell you something. Living your life as a general pattern of anything less than that is rank disobedience, is double-mindedness, is worldliness, is idolatry. I'd be more blunt, but I don't want to offend you. Are you even in a race? Listen, there are some people right now, I want you to think of this for a minute. Different parts of the world, and, and I can name country after country after country where believers are being persecuted. But, but I, I want you to think of this. There are people right now in prison for the gospel because they knew if they preached, if they shared the gospel, if they were caught having a Bible study, if they were baptized, that they could end up in jail. But they had to obey their master. And now they are in jail. I think of a pastor in Vietnam put in jail for the gospel. Listen to me. Married with children. Great suffering and hardship on the whole family. Terrible conditions in prison. Through international pressure, the man was offered an early release, but he said, I can't leave because I've made disciples in the prison, and I need more time with these people. Let me serve out my time so I can win more souls and make more disciples. I, I've read accounts of people in prison for their faith. And, and they begin to communicate from cell to cell. I mean, people who were tortured and abused. And one pastor, one Bulgarian pastor, began to tap messages. They'd figure out codes between themselves. It was a long, tedious thing to tap out a simple message. But they were just in those prison cells for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And through the tedious thing, he began to tap out messages. And the man in the next cell would begin to respond. And over a period of time, the heart would become soft and glorious conversion takes place. And, and I've read these remarkable accounts of it going from prison cell to prison cell to prison cell to prison cell until most of the prisoners in a wing have all gotten converted without everybody, anybody even exchanging a spoken word. Just through tapping on the, on the, the, the doors and the walls, you think, my God, people are living like this. Somebody else is praying through the night and fasting because they're so desperately hungry to see revival come to their community. And somebody else that lives right in your backyard is agonizing for souls and weeping and crying out and saying, oh, God, send revival. And most of the rest of us just kind of sit around and go about our business. Most of the rest of us think, well, they're just really radical. No, friend, they're normal. And the person in prison for the faith is normal. And the person up late at night weeping for souls is normal. It's not normal for a believer when we're moved by sports, but we're not moved by the gospel. That's not normal. You say, I love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, if you watch television more than you read the word in prayer, you're a liar. See, it's so simple to just look at our lives. Promised I'd make it plain, didn't I? Paul said this. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Maybe you are in a race. Maybe you're a mother of six kids. You're a widow. And you're devoted to those kids to raise them so they'll know Jesus. And you're seeking to share with the other mothers in your community. Maybe you're a computer programmer at work. And your mission, your mission is not to be the finest computer programmer. Your mission is not to get the most money you possibly can out of your job. Although you may be the finest in your company and you may get the most money. Your mission is to be a witness. William Carey 
known as the father of modern missions, said this, gave his life in India. He said, my business is to win souls to Christ. I make shoes to pay my expenses. Maybe you can tell me, listen, I want to glorify God. Listen, I, I tell you, I want to be a soul winner. Listen, I, I want to see my church touch the community. Maybe you're in a race, but let me ask you, are you running? Are you running? I'm not talking about getting worked up in a frenzy where you become useless. I'm not talking about pushing yourself to the point that you break your health and die prematurely and don't even touch anybody. You know what it is to run. I remember the one year before I was doing drugs too heavily, before I grew my hair long, I played on the high school basketball team one year and just be a sub in most of the games, start one or two games. But, man, we had these rigorous exercises. How many have ever done wind sprints? You know, they're just, they're, they wouldn't be long, like 50 yards or 50-meter dashes, but you'd finish one, stop, and do another. Finish one, stop, and do another. And then we'd go run and longer and longer. And, and let me tell you, and we weren't godly kids, let me tell you, we were not blessing the coach under our breath either. <laughs> but you, knew, you know what it is to run. You ever been over at a treadmill? Maybe you haven't exercised for a while. And you put that thing on, you know the difference between walking. Someone says, try it like this. Whew, man, that's, that's moving. That's too quick. It's running. Let me ask you, in God, are you running your race? One thing to be in the race. One thing to say, yeah, this is the direction I'm going for Jesus. Praise the Lord. It's another thing to have focus. It's another thing to have intensity. It's another thing to have passion. It's another thing to have to persevere. It's another thing to have to push forward. You know how Paul described his life in Philippians 3? He said, I strain forward. Again, it's athletic imagery. It's the image of somebody bent over, hand reached forward, looking towards the prize. In this case, eyes fixed on Jesus, not looking back, not quitting. Have you ever seen a race and, and it's right towards the end of a race and it's close and, and the sprinters, the race will just lean forward like that. Paul said, that's how I live my life. Come on, some of us know what it is to be driven for sin. Some of, some of us know what it is to be driven by human love. Some of us know what it is to be driven by hunger for money or hunger for drugs or hunger for fame. And yet we become so passive in the kingdom of God. Why is the world going to hell around us? Why are people in such a mess? Maybe we don't understand. We've been called here to work, friend. We've been called here to serve. I don't care if you've been saved for six days or for 60 years. When, when, when Saul of Tarsus met Jesus the Messiah on the road to Damascus, when he realized who he was, because Saul, as a good religious Jew, had given his life to doing the will of God, but he was confused in his ignorance and unbelief. He was fighting against God instead of working for him. Then he found out what it really meant. He found out the one that he was fighting against. He found out Jesus was the risen Lord. You know what he says? What do you want me to do? And Ananias has a message. I'm gonna, the Lord says, I'm going to show him how much he's going to suffer for me. Your life is not your own. That's the word. You are bought with a price. That's the word. Purchase to serve. Purchase to run a race. You say, man, that takes discipline. You bet. Man, that takes vision. You bet. Man, that takes focus. You bet. Man, I can't make a whole lot of excuses. You bet. You know, it struck me some years ago. If someone became a religious Muslim, that person would now pray five times a day. I, I've been in airports sometimes and seen Muslims just laying down their prayer mats and get down on their knees and on their face and pray. When I went to New York University, when I was getting my doctorate in Semitic languages, I had some Arabic classes. I remember one of my third-year Arabic classes that there were, there were three Muslims in the class, and at different times they'd have to go out during the class and find a room and just lay prostrate, have their prayer mat and pray five times a day and then give a certain amount of money. Charity is required. And then during the month of Ramadan, 
not eat or drink anything until sundown every night when they then have a big meal. You could be working hard in the field. You could be sweating and hungry and hot. No, nope. if you're a Muslim, don't eat until 6 in the evening or until sunrise every night during Ramadan, the whole month. Certain disciplines, requirements put on, but you're joining another religion. It's a whole new way of life. Maybe you're a secular Jew and you become a traditional Jew. Every area of your life is now going to be governed. Man, I, I, I really like lobster. No more, son. Boy, I love that pepperoni pizza. No more. Oh, well, I like to eat it. No, there are now dietary laws. And you're going to get up at a certain point. You're going to get up at dawn. You're going to pray certain prayers. And if you're married, you're going to conduct yourself in a certain way and have certain times of separation during that monthly cycle. There's going to be about two weeks out of every month you're not going to touch your wife. I just began to think of one religion after another after another. As sincere as the people are, they haven't come to know God, they haven't had their sins forgiven, they haven't been born again, they haven't entered into eternal life, they haven't had the revelation of the love of God as we've had through the gospel, and yet there's a total turnaround of life. Here's some guy that used to be a businessman now standing on a street corner of New York City with his head shaved, wearing a colored outfit and chanting Hare Krishna. Everything's changed. All, you wouldn't see that guy at the same job the same way, would you? And wouldn't you be surprised if some Orthodox Jew with long beard and black hat and black coat went walking into a local strip joint? And wouldn't you be surprised to be sitting in a bar with a Muslim, his Muslim outfit and his cap, and sitting there slugging away at whiskey? You'd be surprised because you'd say that's a religious person. They don't live like that anymore. And somehow we don't get it. Somehow we don't get it that the change that takes place when you come to know Jesus is more radical and more far-reaching because there's actually a brand new birth. Somehow we don't get it. On Leonard Ravenhill's stationery, on Leonard Ravenhill's tombstone, there's an inscription written. Steve and I had the privilege of being very close to him the last years of his life. I was very close to him the last five years of his life. He went to be with the Lord in 1994 at the age of 87, but he had a little saying on all of the stationery you'd get. Stacks of letters that he sent me, I've got saved up. And there it was across the top of all of them. Are the things you are living for worth Christ dying for? Are the things you are living for worth Christ dying for? Are you really in a race, friend? Are you really running that race I'm sure when I stand before the Lord, I'm not going to look at the glorious face of Jesus and see the hell he saved me from and the mercy he's had on my soul and the eternal blessings of heaven and the smile of my Father. I'm sure I'm not going to look at the face of God and say, I did all that for this. You mean I skipped some meals for this? You mean I went against the grain and suffered a little resistance for you, God? I wish I had taken more vacation time. I wish I had slept in more. I wish I hadn't stayed up so late at night. I wish I hadn't prayed and fasted. I wish, oh, you crazy. I'm going to look at the face of the master and say, oh, God, I wish I'd go back and do it over. How many of you, you have your big moment, you know, you're, you're, maybe you play baseball or softball. For those that aren't from America, most of you know the sport. And you only get up so many times. If you're a typical guy, maybe in a ladies' league or something, and, and you get up, yeah, you, you did okay, but, man, you can't wait to get up again. I ne just next time I'm really going to do it, next time I'm going to hit a home run, next time I'm going to score. And, and some of us live our entire lives like that. You know, next time I'm really going to do it. You know, next time, after I go to the Brownsville Revival, I'm going to come back on fire. Unfortunately, this is your 48th trip here. Oh, once I get into the school of ministry, then I'm, I'm going to be whole and I'm going to run my race. And now it's like once I graduate. And then for the graduates, well, once I'm out in the ministry. It's always tomorrow. It's always out there. It's always next time. And you know, Jesus was incredibly compassionate on the weak 
And he was incredibly forgiving to sinners who would then turn from their sin, but he never tolerated excuses at all, at all. You read the Gospels, and he nailed people who made excuses. Are you running your race? There's a quote I've often chewed on from W.E. Sangster. I believe a Methodist preacher. I read it in the Ravenhill book years ago. I've often thought about this. He said, how shall I feel at the judgment if multitudes of missed opportunities pass before me in full review and all my excuses prove to be disguises of my cowardice and pride? Friend, are you running your race? Let me take this a little deeper. I'm not going to go on too much longer, but I'm going to get a little deeper here. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. Literally in Greek, they exercise self-control in all things. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Listen to me. If you ever watch the Olympics, it's amazing to see athletes that have honed their bodies and their mental skills to react. They have, they have gotten things down to a science. And, and here are people from all around the world, athletes of every color and every size, and yet the top athletes have pushed their bodies to the absolute limit, and it may be one-tenth of a second that separates the gold medal from the silver. Or one one-hundredth of an inch that separates the winner from second place. You watch these people, some people, listen, this is to win a gold medal. This is to win a prize. This is for human athletic achievement, which is wonderful to look at and amazing to see what God's creation can do, but it really doesn't matter all that much in the overall scheme of things. It's not to demean athleticism, it's to say let's put it in perspective. And they'll hold their body. Somebody will eat a, a diet that's just putrid. We wouldn't touch it, but it's for the gold medal. They gotta do it. They gotta discipline themselves. They gotta say no to the flesh. I remember when I was saved for a few months, God gave me this real hunger and thirst for the word and for prayer. And I had an easy high school schedule. So I had a lot of free time. I'd be in church most nights, but services weren't long like our revival services. I had a lot of free time. And I, I began to get in the habit when I was, say, six, eight months a year, I began to get in the habit of spending at least six or seven hours every day reading the scriptures and praying and memorizing scripture every single day. See, I, my life had been so filled with sin and junk and pollution in the world. And, and all the, I, I've always talked about it, but, you know, we got saved. We didn't have music like we have today. So I went straight from Jimi Hendrix to Make Me a Blessing. That was a change from Led Zeppelin to theirs within my heart of melody. I remember early on saying to myself, you know, my life was filled with sin. Now it needs to be filled with God. Now I need to go after God the way I went after those drugs. Now I need to pursue God and let him dominate my life and rule my life the way I allowed sin to do it. And infinitely more, because this is God. And I'd spend six, seven hours, sometimes eight hours, just alone in the Word and prayer, memorizing Scripture. My mind had been so fried by drugs, I used to huff diesel gas to get high sometimes. My mind was fried, but now God was just strengthening me and equipping me. I used to memorize 20 verses every single day without missing a day, week in, week out, month in, month out, for months. And I remember it was, it was coming time for the Olympics, and I read about one American wrestler, and he was training to win the gold medal, and he won the gold medal. He used to train seven hours a day. If it was snowing outside and freezing, he'd be out there jogging. It didn't matter what the conditions were. It didn't matter, hot, cold, rainy. He was out there, he was training. And I looked at my life and said, praise God, I'm training seven hours a day also. I looked at his life and what he was after. I looked at my life and what I was after. I said, this makes sense. A very few people here have that kind of time that I had then. But I watched that athlete. I watched him train. I'd read about boxers, and a lot of boxers were not the most disciplined people. They got into boxing because they got into fights on the streets. Some of them in between fights were having drug problems and so on. You don't exactly think of boxers and holiness in the same word and phrase. And yet I'd read about some boxers six weeks before a fight. 
Not only were they getting up super early and jogging and, and, and eating certain meals just to get strength in their body and to get rid of all body fat. Not only were they pummeling themselves to get stronger and tougher, some of them would not have sexual relations for six or eight weeks before a fight because they felt it would drain their energy. That's how, that's how they live for a boxing match. Then you think of maybe a musician. You, 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 you go to a concert, and here's maybe a world-class violinist, and you listen to her play, and it's, it's phenomenal. The tones, the, the beauty of it, the dexterity on her finger. You say, this is, this is almost impossible. If you play the, an instrument, and you look at one of these people, you say, this is almost impossible. But you know how, how that person got there? Since they were a little kid, their parents probably drove them and said, practice, 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 practice. And they'll sit there maybe 10 hours in a day going through their exercises. A pianist going through a piece, he's played it a thousand times by heart. He's playing it again and again and again and again. You'll have people in places of rabbinic study, Orthodox Jews study 16, sometimes 18 hours a day. You'll see in famous pictures of their study halls, and there's the candle, and their heads are collapsing as they're studying it, prop themselves up to study some more because they believe it's sacred. And then you look at somebody else working 80, 90 hours a week just to make an extra buck. Steve will talk about it. You go by the business buildings, and there they are, lights on at midnight, burning the midnight oil to get ahead, make some extra bucks. Some of you live like that. Here's what's amazing, friends. Paul says, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it. We do it to get a crown that will last forever. That's how we live, he's saying. That's how we live. They live like that to get ahead. They live like that to win a medal. They win like that to get an earthly prize. We live like that to get an eternal prize. We normally put the emphasis on the eternal prize part. Paul's emphasis here is on both. Yes, there's an eternal prize, but this is how we live. Can you look at an athlete and say, that's the way I follow Jesus? Can you look at a musician and an artist and say, with that same devotion, with that same passion, with that same discipline, that's how I follow Jesus? Paul talks about people whose belly is their God. We here in America, in Europe, and much of the world represented by the nations here, we live in a pleasure-saturated, entertainment-oriented, worldly society. Let me just tell you a quick story. My wife and I have a wonderful relationship, and she looks to me as the priest of the home and as the the head of the home. We're here in Pensacola. She knew that God was calling us down here, but we're here because God spoke to me to move here and put our roots down here. We've moved in different parts of America and been involved in all kinds of ministry, and she's followed knowing that God's told me to do things. But she'll also speak the truth to me, and I welcome it. Sometimes I welcome it, sometimes I don't, but in the end, I always welcome it. One time, I was going to fast, and I remember thinking to myself, I wish fasting wasn't so effective because then I'd have an excuse why I wasn't going to fast. But because fasting always accomplished its great things when it was done in faith and harmony in God, not as a religious work, but, but as a discipline and in harmony and to get in the spirit and to go after God in different ways, boy, things happen. Well, the fellow came to me and he said, listen, I, 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 need, I need direction. Would, would you fast with me? He's a former student, a friend of mine. I said, listen, man. I've been needing to hear from God about some major issue. I'm going to fast too. Why don't we fast five days? Okay, five days. And you know, sometimes five days on water can, it can feel like a long time. Sometimes. Sometimes it can be tough. Some people fast just really easily. Some it's more of a battle. Almost all my fasts have been battles of some kind. Well, before I went on the fast, the Lord spoke to me and answered the question, I was praying for direction, and he gave me the answer before the fast. Now it's like somebody took the wind out of my sails. What am I fasting for when I already have my answer? And then my friend wimped out on me. We were praying together. It was the morning of the second day. 
and I knew from the tone of his voice and the wimpiness of his prayers, he was ready to eat lunch. <laughs> and I said to him, listen, just give me your word that at least you won't go out of here and have lunch. He said, I can't say that. So he goes out and wimps out. Now I'm fasting. I don't have any incentive to fast. The guy fasting with me is wimped out. So now by the morning of the third day, I'm decided I'm going to eat. Now sometimes my wife has talked to me during a fast, and she'll, I'll say, look, I'm hungry. And she'll say, you're not hungry, you're lusting for food. And I say, uh, listen, I am hungry. I'm not lusting for food, I'm hungry. She'll say, fine, have a piece of bread and an apple. I don't want a piece of bread and an apple. Be during the fast, and I'll say, you know, I, I feel, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to break the fast later. And she'll say, I thought you said the Lord told you to fast for a week. It's only the fourth day. And I'll say, well, what happened was I said, Lord, I want to fast for a week, and he gave me the release to do it. He didn't actually tell me to do it, but he, like, okayed that I could do it. And, and I remember her telling me once, why don't you write down before your next fast exactly what God told you? Because it somehow changes during the fast. So this particular time, I was teaching actually an advanced Hebrew class or an intensive Hebrew class to some of the leaders in the Messianic congregation. I was working with them together, and, and I, was, I was doing this, and I was hungry, and I, I had it set. I have to admit, I had lunch all planned out. Popeye's fried chicken. <laughs> it's a good healthy way to break a fast. It was only the third day. But because Nancy knew I was fasting, I had to tell her. I couldn't just eat because, you know, she'd be standing with me when I fasted. So I called home. I said, listen, honey, you know, I, you know, I already have the answer. I, was, you know, and, and I won't mention his name, you know, but he, he dropped out, you know, and, I, you know, I really, I'm hungry. It's, you know, I'm, I'm going to go have lunch. She said, you're not having lunch. I said, well, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go have lunch. And, you know, I don't really feel to keep fasting. And she said, you're not having lunch. She said, you're a man of God. She said, your stomach is not your God. You're not eating. Now, bear in mind, we're both New York Jews. We can handle that kind of stuff. If it happened in some home here, you know, you might come after her with a hatchet or something. So I don't want to provoke anything here or start anything. In fact, if somebody gave me this book, this is the kind of stuff I have to deal with here, some of the persecution I get coming from the north. But some of, somebody gave me this book, Speaking Southern Like It Should Be Spoke. <laughs> Someone else gave me a dictionary on how to speak southern, and I'm fixing to read both of them. But I, I don't want, I, I'm trying to sensitize myself to redneck culture, you know, so if, if my wife was your wife, sir, and spoke to you the way you did in your culture, you might have had a Christian right to decapitate her on the spot. But this was fine with us, just a cultural thing, okay? Was that good? Was that sensitive? Am I learning a lot? Growing? But I, I remember just those words, you know? Your stomach is not your God. You're a man of God. You're not, you're not ruled by your stomach. You're not carnal. I do have to say that by dinner time, I convinced her it would be a great night for the whole family to go out and get a nice dinner. <laughs> but you know, it's an interesting thing here. Paul talks about discipline. Paul talks about going into strict training. Let me tell you something. This revival would have ended a long time ago if not for leaders, congregants, workers throughout this revival seeking to live like this. There'd be nothing here today. You say, oh, it's all grace. It's all the goodness of God. Friend, it is the goodness of God, but God is working with human beings. I'll let you smile for a second. I'll let you take your defenses down. That's called fattening you for the slaughter, by the way. But look, you look at your life. Look at the end of a week, all the hours wasted. Look at the end of a day, all the missed opportunities. I'm not talking about living some legalistic, hung up way. I'm talking about running a race. Look at that athlete. Look at her. Look at him. Look at the discipline. Look at the training. Look at the focus. If you're not living like that, then you're in disobedience to the word. Why is our nation in the state that it's in? Here in America, so many tens of millions of professing Christians. 
Why is our nation the way it's in? Because we're not running a race. Because homosexuals have come out of the closet and they're active and bold. Radical feminists on college campuses, they're active and bold with their agenda. And Hollywood's active and bold with its agenda. But the church wants to be passive. The church wants to live this conservative life. We want to save our lives rather than following the biblical mandate and lose them for the gospel. Could it be that God sent you here to Brownsville for reasons other than what you expected? Could it be that he sent you here to revolutionize your life? I'm almost done. Paul applied this to himself. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body. He's not talking about whipping himself or wearing burlap sacks under his clothes to suffer misery all the time. Pain and hardship and poverty and difficulty don't necessarily make anybody holy at all. But see, this is also an image from the games. The, the Greek is literally to punch someone below the eye, to blacken the eye. Paul said, that's what I do to my body. Boom, flesh, you're not going to rule me. Some men here come out of this meeting and there'll be a pornographic movie in the hotel. Boom, you run right after that thing. You get home to write down some thoughts the Lord's given you within five minutes. Pooh, you're just running after that internet porn. Like animals driven and pulled. Some ladies here come away from the meeting. I'm going to go after God. I'm going to subdue this flesh. You just realize one hour has gone by gazing at yourself in the mirror, fixing yourself up for service when you haven't spent ten minutes on your knees. It's time for upheaval. I've been around the world. I've, I've been outside of America and preaching trips about 60 different times and probably spent a couple years total. I've never been a missionary full-time overseas, but going three weeks here, a month here, a couple weeks here. I was going over and over and over to other parts of the world. Had the privilege of being in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of meetings around the world. And you know what strikes me? A lot of these places I go, you go to a place like India, the Christians have one focus live for Jesus, win souls, touch our nation. You pray with the children, and they're weeping for the lost. Those that have been to India with me, am I telling the truth? We have other friends working in other parts of the world, healing the sick, setting the captives free. They have a focus. Some of us can't even pray five minutes with focus. Some of us are watching our families in disarray, and we can't even say, I'm going to go after God until the breakthrough comes. Are you just like beating the air? Are you going somewhere? Are you doing damage to the kingdom of darkness? I beat my body, meaning I, 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 I bring it down. I don't let the flesh rule, Paul said. I don't let the body rule. I don't let the desires of the mind and the world rule. I make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. And then... Through this 10th chapter, he talks about how you can be disqualified and never enter in. Everybody stand to your feet with me. Nobody move around, please. Nobody moving in and out. Everybody stay right here. We're going to do things a little differently tonight. We're not going to have charity sing mercy seat. Listen to me. You may be here and you don't know Jesus at all. I'm talking to Christians, I'm talking to believers, you're saying, what in the world is that? Just like I walked into a church in 71 as a Jewish kid, what in the world is all this? I don't know what your background is. You may be here and you don't know Jesus. Your sins are not forgiven. Let me tell you, just as surely as you're standing here breathing, in a moment of time you're going to be standing before the throne of God. If you ever stood before a judge, you know it can be frightening. He's going to have every wrong thing you ever did on record. Every wrong thought. Sir, every woman you raped in your mind, even if you never touched one. Ma'am, every judgmental, angry, ugly, bitter thought you ever thought. Every wrong deed, every wrong word, every wrong action, every wrong thought. All the years that you failed to put God first, all the times you failed to love your neighbors, yourself, all the good you could have done and you didn't do, and you are going to be guilty Guilty, guilty. No detours, no U-turns, no doing it again, no calling in a big lawyer to get you out, no bribes. Guilty. 
and the door will be shut and it'll be over forever. Your worst nightmare, scratching and guilt and trying to get out, and you can't. The good news is, friend, you don't have to die like that. That day can be a day when you enter into a wonderful place and your father greets you and says, come on in, son, come on in, girl. You're mine. See, Jesus, why did he have to die such a horrific death? Why did, why did it take the Son of God coming down? Because somebody had to pay for all of our sins. You can't die for me, I can't die for you because we've all sinned, we've all blown it. But he died for every sin. You may have abused children, sir. The shame is overwhelming. You may have served time for it. Jesus died for that sin. There's an awesome testimony of a man named David Berkowitz, a serial killer, the most notorious serial killer in New York City's history. Jesus died for his sin, and he's an on-fire believer today. Whatever you've done, you may be on drugs right now. You may just be away from God. Maybe you've known God in the past, and you've fallen away. Jesus died for your sins, and he's saying, come to me. Lay the old life down. You say, it's hard. You cry out to him and he'll save you. That's why we call him the Savior. Because he saves us from sin. Just like he saved Cowboy from 48 years of two or three packs of cigarettes a day. Saved him in a moment and he's been clean every day since then. That's the power of God. That's the power of God that can set you free. Or maybe, most of you I'm speaking to would say, I'm a believer. But you'd say, man, I'm not living the way you were talking about. I'm not running that race, man. I'm waste, I've wasted years. I'm just out there. I, God said, tonight if you'll come and cry out to me, he said, I'll set you free. He'll start something brand new. See, it's God who works in you. He's after you. He's the one doing the work. He's the one that's going to see it through. Nobody here is going to live an absolutely perfect life the rest of your life, but I tell you, the whole pattern of your life from here on can be, I'm going after God. It says about Enoch, he walked with God. The Hebrew just speaks of going back and forth. Steve described it as habitual fellowship. Enoch, what are you doing? I'm walking with God. 20 years later, Enoch, what are you doing? I'm walking with God. 100 years later, Enoch, what are you doing? I'm walking with God. The pattern of your life can be obedience. God can use you to bear much fruit. But I'm telling you, you're going to have to lay it all down. No more holds barred, no more ifs. If you know there's sin in your life, lay it down right here and say, God, I'm through with it in Jesus' name. If there's compromise, if you've been holding back, if you've been afraid to step out in obedience, if you've never known the Lord, tonight's your night. Father, in Jesus' name, bring this word home to every heart and every life and seal it now. Friend, if God's speaking to you, if this message is for you, come down here right now. Get on your knees before God. Don't wait for anybody. If this is for you, if this is for you, I want you to come right now from the front, from the balcony. I don't want you to wait for anybody else. If God's speaking to you, come now. Don't wait for music. Don't wait for anything else. Sir, young person in the balcony, you listening at home, if God's dealing with you, I don't care if you've been in ministry for 30 years. I don't care if you were at this altar last night weeping. If God's speaking to you, I want you to come right now. I want you to come right now. About one-tenth of the people that are coming are on their way right now. I want you to come. If God's dealing with you, step out. Are you running your race? Are you running your race? Are you living the way we're talking about here tonight? If not, I want you to come. Lay the sin down. Lay the disobedience down. Lay the compromise down. Lay the excuses down. Jesus. If God's dealing with you, I want you to come right now. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. You say it's a long way down from the balcony. Come down, friend. Jesus came down from heaven to earth to die for you. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he'll lift you up. Just begin to play quietly, Charlie. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Get on your knees and say, God, have mercy on me. God, wash me. God, change me. Listen, friend, it's time to quit playing games. It's time to quit playing games. Look me in the eyes. Are you right with God? If you can't look me in the eyes, if you can't say my hands are clean, my heart's pure, I'm running my race, I'm going after God. Jesus is the Lord of my life. My life is to do his will, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. If you can't say that, get down to this altar, friend. Humble yourself. I'm talking to you. This is not for the super saints. This is for every single believer. This is for everyone here who's away from God. This is for everyone here who's never known Jesus. Keep coming. Worship team, come on out here. Jesus, I'm not out to get a crowd. I'm not out to see how many we have tonight that's never been what the revival's about. 
but there are at least 75, 100 people that God's dealing with you, but you won't step out because you're thinking, well, what are people going to think? Well, if I do, how is it going to look? Can that, friend? That's your whole problem. That's the very thing we're talking about, that wimpy living. And the balcony, are you right with God? Are you right with God? Are you running your race? I didn't ask if you're perfect. I asked if you're running your race. Jesus, break hearts tonight. Jesus, change lives tonight. Bring us to repentance. Some here used to be on fire, then you got in that relationship, and now he's a God to you. Now she's a God to you. Jesus is taking a back seat somewhere. Maybe some of you are really going to go after God, but after the Super Bowl, after the sports season, because that's got your heart and that's got your passion. Jesus, Jesus. There are only three classes of people that are here tonight. Those that are fully yielded, usher, send them around. Those that are saying, by the grace of God, I'm running my race. I'm stretched out. I'm living for Jesus. I can tell you that before God. I'm living for God. I'm going after God. I'm stretched out to do his will. People on this worship team can testify the very same thing or they wouldn't be standing up here. If that's you, then you should be saying, oh, God, I want to please you even more. Stand right where you are in your seat, but saying, God, I want to please you even more. There are others here, you're playing games and you know it. You're one of those that I talked about. Lord, I love you raising your hands in church and watching three hours of television in a day and reading the word 20 minutes. Friends, that's a mockery of the gospel. That's a mockery of the death of Jesus. Oh, God, you mean everything to me. Oh, you weep when your team loses in sports, but you don't weep for souls. Lord, you're mine until the right person comes along and snatches you away in the bed for a little while. Until drugs, drink, pull you down. Some here are running their race, heart and soul, mind and strength. God bless you tonight. We're going to pray for a fresh anointing and the power of the Spirit to touch you. There are others here, you're either not in the race at all or you're not running. Friend, why not humble yourself? You say, look at the people that have come. Isn't that enough, friend? Not if you haven't come. Not if God's tugging on your heart. And then there are others here, you've never even known Jesus. Or you've been away from him for so long, you can't even figure out your way back. Friend, God's ready to have mercy on you. He's not out to condemn you. The same one that sent his son to die for you, saying, come on, come on, come on. I want everybody here that loves Jesus to begin to pray. Those at the altar, focus in on the Lord. If you're giving your life to Jesus, if you're coming back to him, if you're getting right with him, you pour out your heart to him. Right at this altar, you pour out your heart to him. You ask him for mercy. Tell him, I can't live the way I've been living anymore. Everybody else, give yourself to prayer. Give yourself to prayer. Jesus, God, break hearts. Break resistance, Lord. Break resistance. Break resistance in Jesus' name. Grant repentance, Lord. Shake off. Shake off that hold your people back. Shake it off of them. Shake it off of them, Jesus. Set them free. Set them free. Set them free. Set them free. Jesus. 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 Lord Jesus. It's not too late. It's not too late. It's not too late. It's not too late. This is what you were made for, friend. This is what you were saved for. God bless you, man. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus said the day is going to come. The day is going to come. He said it. It's a sure thing. That the door is going to be shut. And, and, and people are going to say, but, 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 but the Lord, 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 we ate with you. And Lord, we, we, we drank with you. And we, he's going to say, no, 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 I never knew you. Shoot. Shut. Friends, the door is still open. If you're not sure about your relationship with God, if you're not sure if you're saved, if you're not sure that your sins are forgiven, get on your knees and say, God, change me. If you can't look me in the eyes and say, brother, I'm running this race. I'm going after God. 
then how can you look God in the eyes? Friend, if you're coming, come on now. If you're coming, come now. Jesus, everyone at this altar, pour your heart out to God. He's near to the brokenhearted. There's not a one of you that he drives away. He's pleased. He's rejoicing that you're coming. He welcomes you. Anybody else that's coming, come on, there are more. God's dealing with you. God's dealing with you. Jesus, God's dealing with you. You may be watching at home. Right now, the Spirit's speaking to you. Right in your living room, you may be sitting in that proverbial lazy boy, and there's an arrow in your heart, and God's saying, will you live for me? Will you live for me? Right where you are, say, yes, Lord, no more games. No more games, no more holding back and live for Jesus. One last time, I ask you, will you lay it all down? Will you lay it all down? Sir, will you lay it all down? You say, if I do, that means I, I can't fool around with another woman the rest of my life. I've got to be faithful to my wife. Yes, sir. Young person, you're going to lay it all down. Well, that means I'm going to have to keep myself sexually pure until I'm married. Yes. Maybe a young woman, young man, bound by drugs. I know what it feels like. I know what it is to look at that mountain and say, I'll, I'll never put a needle in my arm again. And then look down at that little, little thing that used to be such a big mountain. Whatever the sin is, is it worth going to hell for? The only sin you should hold on to is the sin worth going to hell for. I just feel a battle going on with a few people. I'm just going to wait a little bit longer. Those at the altar, just keep pouring your heart out to God. Charlie, keep playing. There's a battle here. I, I sense it for, for a young man. You know what it's going to mean to follow Jesus, and, and you're just saying, I, I'm not quite ready. I'm not quite ready. You may be like a 16-year-old kid that told the pastor of the church where I got saved. I was just 16 myself, and the 16-year-old told the pastor, I'm going to live to be 100, man. I got plenty of time. And a few weeks later, he and his three friends absolutely killed, mutilated, instantly killed in a car wreck. He didn't live to be 17. I'm going after you. Young man, make the surrender. God's speaking to you specifically. I'm not looking around to try and figure out what's up. You know what it's going to mean. You know it's going to mean no more playing games. You know it's going to mean no more running the way of the world. God bless you, man. Get on your knees before God. Someone else. Someone else. Is God dealing with you? Is there a sin in your life? Is there something that you know is wrong in God's sight? Answer yes or no in your heart. If the answer is yes, why haven't you laid it down? Why haven't you laid it down? Sing, Lord, have mercy one last time, and then this altar call is closed. If you're coming, now the door of mercy is open. Come now. Come now. Come now. Go ahead. Everybody at this altar, you've been up here for a few minutes, but just talk to God. Just pour your heart out. Ask him in your own words to have mercy on your soul. Ask him in your own words to change you. Ask him in your own words to set you free. 
Some of you are so frustrated because it's been over and over and over and over and over. You never seem to change. Tonight, God's going to have mercy on you, friend. Tonight, God's going to help you. Tonight, obedience is going to become the pattern of your life. And sin's going to be the exception to the rule. Jesus. 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 We're going to pray with everybody in a minute, but I want you to just meet with God. Let the surgeon do his work, friend. Let the surgeon do his work. Jesus. All to Jesus. Jesus. I surrender. This is it, friends. All to him. It's what you're made for, my friend. Only Jesus. He's the meaning of our lives. He's everything, friend. That be your prayer. Charity, sing that once for us. Keep playing, Charlie. It's the only thing that makes sense. Only thing that makes sense. I surrender all, Jesus. Surrender all. Jesus. Surrender all. Mercy. Mercy. Jesus, Jesus, he'll be the strength in your life, friend. He'll be the strength in your life. Let him show you right now the patterns that have to change, the relationships that have to change, the things that have to go. He'll be your strength, friend. Better you run too fast and he has to slow you down in your zeal than he has to raise you from the dead all the time. The Lord asks you tonight at this altar, how serious are you? What would you tell him? You ought to tell him right now how serious you are. You ought to tell him tonight how deeply and how desperately you want to please him. How you don't want to be disqualified. You don't want to be cast away. You don't want to fall short. You don't want to waste the one life you have. He sees that, friend. That's worth more to him than millions of dollars. It's worth more to him than all types of religious acts. Just to see that heart saying, God, more than anything, I want to please you. Jesus. Everybody at this altar, everyone that wants to join in, in the congregation, say this out loud with me. Heavenly Father, I confess my sin to you. I recognize it, and I make no excuses. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me for selfishness. Forgive me for loving this life more than I've loved you. Forgive me for dropping out of the race and not running my race with perseverance. I ask you tonight to wash me clean. I ask you tonight to give me a fresh new start. I ask you tonight to set me free from every habit, 
from every sin, from every pattern of my life that displeases you. From here on, I'm asking you, Lord, to lead me and to dominate my life and to be the Lord of my life. I give myself to you without condition, without reserve, and I say for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. My heart is yours. My mind is yours. My body is yours. My life is yours. I'm in the race. I'm going to win. I'm going to please you. I'm going to see your face. I'm going to hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. This night, I consecrate myself to you. Strengthen me. Keep me. Be my Lord, my Savior, my friend, my helper. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.